Number 10, Dog. Dog, spelled D-A-W-G, is the companion of Lobo over at DC. Mostly Lobo just tolerates Dog's presence though and doesn't think of Dog as his own pet. Dog might look like the bulldogs of Earth, but he's actually an alien who just looks like a bulldog. He's known for being quite durable and like Lobo can survive in the vacuum of space. Dog also sometimes is seen smoking and was originally recognizable in the comics by his cross collar, which actually resembled the red iron cross, a symbol that Lobo also wore back then, so they had kind of like matching little necklaces. The modern version of Dog no longer appears to be associated with this symbol. Fans of Lobo might be fans of Dog, although it should be noted that in the original New Earth continuity, Lobo was actually the one who ended up killing that alien after Dog himself was possessed. Number 9, Comet the Super Horse. Comet is an interesting one and really ranks lower not because he lacks power, but because he secretly actually a man or a centaur really. A centaur that was accidentally turned into a full on horse by Circe, but who could also become a human whenever a magical comet flew by. While Comet made for a very useful and loyal animal sidekick to Supergirl, who also came with a slew of other abilities including flight, telepathy, and immortality, he also was kind of a creeper. You see Byron, Comet's original name when he was a centaur, actually falls in love with Supergirl and when he takes his human form for that short while, he decides to try and woo her. He becomes, I think his name is Bill Starr. He's a rodeo man. He rides the horses. He rides the bulls? What do people ride at rodeos? Bulls? I think bulls. I don't know. <laughs> I've never been to a rodeo. Someone take me to a rodeo. Byron decides it's best if Supergirl never knows that he is actually also her horse. And I get it. You know, it's complicated. But still, that's pretty messed up, Byron. Like, you make a loyal animal sidekick, but not a very honest human love interest. Although I guess with Comet, you're like, I get a magical horse and I get a boyfriend, which maybe back in the day was like, I don't know, cool for girls of the time. They were like, I want a flying horse that can also turn into my boyfriend. What a weird time. Or maybe that's just what people thought girls wanted. I don't know. Number eight, Tippy Toe. I mean, you gotta give it up for Tippy Toe. Tippy Toe is Doreen Green's, AKA Squirrel Girl's main animal sidekick currently in the comics. Before Tippy, it was Monkey Joe. And of course, Squirrel Girl can have a whole team of squirrel sidekicks if she wants to, as that's kind of her thing, communicating with squirrels and convincing them to team up with her. Really convincing many people to team up with her and be her friends. Tippy Toe is often recognized by her bright pink bow. She doesn't have any superpowers per se, but is a very smart, resourceful, and inspiring squirrel. She has demonstrated that she has skills as a leader, leading an entire squirrel army on Doreen's behalf. She's gone up against the likes of AIM and Thanos, and not only survived, but also helped to beat them too. Okay. Number seven, Eagly. One of the most ridiculous but quickly becoming one of the greatest animal sidekicks of all time is Eagly. Eagly is Peacemaker's sidekick in the DCEU. He appears in Peacemaker's HBO Max self titled series. So far, Eagly has been a great companion to Peacemaker. We've seen Peacemaker use his animal sidekick to distract enemies, and have also seen that Peacemaker doesn't just see Eagly as his crime fighting partner, but also very much as like his pet and his friend. Eagly also seems to be very well trained and to have a strong bond with Peacemaker. There is no doubt in my mind Eagly would probably do whatever Chris asked of him and likely would fight just as hard and ruthlessly in Peacemaker's fight for peace. Eagly the Eagle, what a great name. Number 6, Jeff the Land Shark. Jeffrey the Land Shark is definitely one of my all time personal favorite animal sidekicks in the Marvel Universe. I honestly would have ranked him higher if there weren't so many star animal sidekicks on this list. For me, in my heart, he is number one. but. I felt weird giving the number one spot to Jeff because there's so many other really awesome ones too. Technically Jeff is a little monster, not quite an animal, but he's animal-like enough for me to put him on this list, so just roll with it. Jeff has been the partner to Gwenpool, Elsa Bloodstone, Deadpool, and most recently Kate Bishop's Hawkeye in his own self-titled series, Marvel Infinity Webtoon series, It's Jeff. Also if you haven't read It's Jeff by Kelly Thompson and Guri Hiro, you need to pause this video and go scroll through at least 
one issue on the Marvel Unlimited app. You can start with issue one if you want. All the issues are great though, honestly, so you can't really start in a wrong spot. Then you can come back and resume watching. And if you fell in love with that series, like me, there is going to be a follow up one this year, so don't worry, Marvel has even more Jeff coming your way. Number five, Red Wing. Red Wing is the animal companion of Sam Wilson. In the series Falcon and the Winter Soldier on Disney Plus, the Falcon we know as Red Wing in the comics was swapped out for a drone companion, which also shares the name of its 616 counterpart. Red Wing was actually the reason that we thought for a hot minute that Sam himself might be a mutant, and the reason that Sam questioned his origin and with it, his potential power set. You see, Wilson and Red Wing could actually communicate telepathically, which Sam thought could be as a result of latent mutant powers emerging. In reality, their telepathic link was actually a result of the machinations of the evil Red Skull. It turned out this link was created using the Cosmic Cube. To this day though, Sam still has a telepathic link with Red Wing, and Red Wing still fights by Wilson's side, even during his time in the comics as Captain America. And probably his future time as Captain America, since he's probably going to be returning to that role. Yay! Number 4, Topo. Topo was Aquaman's ally and pet back in the New Earth continuity. Topo is an octopus, or at least... He was an octopus originally. The Prime Earth version of him looks a bit more like a cuttlefish octo hybrid to me. But based on his tentacles, I think he's still meant to be an octopus. Just a much more giant octopus in comparison to the original. Or maybe the original one just got real big. In this, in this universe. The New Earth version of Topo was a purple octopus who was known for his superior dexterity with his tentacles and his super strength. Aside from those more unique traits, he also had all the abilities of a regular octopus. In the Prime Earth continuity, Topo was called upon to help King Arthur, aka Aquaman, to defend Atlantis and later on to help him infiltrate it during his exile. He's great. Number 3, Lockjaw. Lockjaw has to be one of the best animal sidekicks around simply because he also happens to be one one of the most powerful out there. Lockjaw is the animal companion of Black Bolt, king of the Inhumans, but he also serves and is a member of the Inhuman royal family. He's a big teleporting doggo who represents a bulldog and, like the other Inhumans, gets his powers from the Terrigen Mists and process of Terrigenesis. Having a teleporting dog would definitely be one of the coolest and most useful things. Teleportation is rad. When it comes to Lockjaw's range and capabilities, by the way, he's a powerful teleporter just in regards to the Marvel Universe, not even just like in regards to animals in the Marvel Universe. He can teleport you all the way into space and can even take you to other dimensions. Number 2, Ace the Bat Hound. Honestly, we could probably just have a list of best doggo sidekicks. There are lots of them in the comic book world. I'm not sure actually if there are more monkeys slash gorillas slash apes or more dogs, but I bet it's pretty close between those two categories. Ace the Bat Hound wasn't actually really Bruce's dog, but instead was a dog that Batman and Robin found and then decided to adopt to use in a case, getting his help to locate his owner who had been kidnapped. Ace proved to be a heroic dog and as such Ace became the Bat Hound, until he was returned to his rescued owner. Even after Ace would occasionally be called upon to help Batman in his time of need, with the given excuse of Bruce Wayne claiming he just really liked having the animal around and wanted to have him visit Wayne Manor every now and then because he was good company, which his rightful owner actually agreed to. During Rebirth in the 2016 Batman series, Ace's backstory was changed and the doggo gets a super sweet and heartbreaking origin story. Here the dog suffered trauma at the hands of the Joker, being made into one of his pets and then basically abandoned by the Joker. Alfred pities the dog who was dressed up as an Ace card when found initially. Alfred takes in and trains Ace, rescuing Ace and turning the doggo into a good boy intended as a holiday gift for Bruce. Although that part of Ace's story goes right over Bruce's head. He's like, you didn't get me a gift, Alfred. Alfred's like, I mean, I just trained this dog and it was a lot of work, but sure, sure, yeah, I forgot. I forgot to get you a gift, Bruce, thanks. Number one, Lockheed. Lockheed obviously is one of my all time favorite animal companions and there are surprisingly a lot of them that I was able to reminisce about while writing this list, and a lot of them that I love. Many who didn't even make my cut this time around, but honestly who still deserve to. But above them all, in my mind, is Lockheed. Though to be honest, the question of which Lock is the best from Marvel between Lockheed and Lockjaw is a pretty intense debate. Both are great animal sidekicks, and Lockjaw is just super OP as a teleporter in general. Lockheed isn't technically 
an animal and isn't as powerful as in humans best friend Lockjaw, but what he lacks in power, he makes up for in heart and in stealthiness. Lockheed was actually once an agent of S.W.O.R.D. and was basically Abigail Brand's undercover agent who was secretly keeping an eye on the X-Men at the time. However, Lockheed still will probably always remain most loyal to his bestie, Kitty Pride, aka Captain Kate. He would defend her to the ends of the earth and actually left his homeworld, his civilization, and his fiance behind just to go on adventures with Kate. He's like a little space dragon, which I guess makes Kate Marvel's mother of dragons. Either Kate or Jubilee, I think, deserves that title. Or both of them can share it. I'm fine with that. Since Jubilee's son is also literally kind of a dragon. Number 10, Outcast. Who is Hit Monkey really? Well, he's a monkey who's an assassin. Yep, it's really that simple. But how did he become an assassin? Well, that happened as a result of him becoming what he hated the most, really. He was part of a tribe of monkeys who took in a wounded assassin who stumbled kind of into their home. They nursed the assassin back to help, but Hit Monkey, who then was, you know, just known as a nameless monkey, disagreed with this decision. He studied the assassin as he practiced and built back his strength and ended up adopting his sense of violence to try and basically fight back against the other monkeys whom he disagreed with because he wanted to protect them really. As a result, he was banished from his tribe because they were like, we don't like your violent ways. No, 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 no monkey, get out. Number nine, the assassin. The assassin we see in the trailer who uses snowmen for target practice, that's the assassin who came to his tribe and who hit monkey studied and was kicked out for emulating. In the comics, the assassin is never given a name but has some kind of spiritual connection to hit monkey and after he dies has unfinished business to carry out with hit monkey as his aid. Just like in his origin story from the comics, the assassin in the trailer warns hit monkey about following in his footsteps and after his death returns in spirit form to guide hit monkey. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn even more about hit monkey as the show goes on, be sure to show your love and show your support by giving this video a thumbs up. Number eight, vengeance. What turned him into a hitman? Well, the missing part of the origin here is that after Hitmonkey was thrown out and exiled by his tribe, he actually learns while wandering alone that there are men who have come to retrieve the assassin, hunting him down. Hitmonkey attempts to return home to warn his tribe, but he actually arrives too late. They and the assassin they were harboring are all dead. In a fit of rage, Hitmonkey eliminates all the men sent to kill the assassin, hunting down the last one to escape and his commander and eliminating them as well. From there and out, he was sent down a path that would turn him into Hit Monkey. Number seven, voiced by. Fred Tadascori is an extremely experienced voice actor who has been actively working in the industry for over 20 years. He will be voicing the star of this series, Hit Monkey himself. Seriously though, Tadascori's list of credits is so long that I'm pretty sure if we just like ran them all across the screen during this point for you to read, we wouldn't even give you enough time to read them all. He has voiced characters in video games, animated series, cartoons, and English dubs for animes. If you are a hardcore Marvel fan, then you may know him best as the Hulk across the games and animated series that he's voiced in. Hulk is a common character for him to voice. He even voiced the Hulk when the character showed up in the Disney animated series Phineas and Ferb during a crossover episode. Also, if you didn't know that happened, that happened. And if you love Phineas and Ferb, like me, you probably really loved that crossover episode. Number six, Japanese macaque also known as Nihonzaru in Japanese. Hitmonkey is a Japanese macaque. The Japanese macaque is known for being the northernmost living of all non-human primate species. They are also sometimes referred to as snow monkeys for this same reason, living in places where snow covers the ground for multiple months of the year. Hence why in the trailer we see Hitmonkey and the fellow monkeys living in a snowy region, possibly in the mountains where they also have access to hot springs. In fact, Japanese macaques are known for enjoying hot springs together as a group and for rolling up snowballs for fun. <laughs> it's true, it's a thing. Number five, first appearance. Hitmonkey in the comics made his first appearance in his own digital series in issue number one of Hitmonkey, which was exclusively released on the Marvel Unlimited app. Yeah, Marvel Unlimited has been around since 2010, when this issue was first released. In fact, Marvel Unlimited first became a thing back in 2007. Isn't that crazy? It's been around for so long. Hitmonkey was a character created by Daniel Wei and Dalibor Talogic, with the first cover being completed by Frank Cho. The follow-up limited series saw Hitmonkey take on one of Marvel's most deadly and accurate assets. Assassin's Bullseye. And straight out of the gate, Hitmonkey was giving him a run for his money. I almost said a run for his monkey money, but I don't think Bullseye has monkey money. <laughs> what is even monkey money? 
It's not a thing. Number 4, Lady Bullseye. While in the comics we know that Hitmonkey is faced off with the likes of a deadly villain and also hired assassin Bullseye, in the trailer for the Hulu original animated series about Hitmonkey, there appears another villain who could easily be standing in for him. That would be Lady Bullseye. The question is, how will she be introduced without her male counterpart? Lady Bullseye actually became an assassin herself because of Bullseye, who appeared to save her when she was just a child appeared to save her. Appeared being important there. Maki Matsumato, as she was once known, was a prisoner of the Yakuza. They had despicable plans for her, but were stopped by Bullseye, who had a contract to basically kill her captors. The sight of him killing them in front of her eyes inspired Lady Bullseye to become a killer herself, and so she set down a path that would lead her to becoming the villain she's known for in the comics today. Number 3, Fat Cobra. Speaking of villains that we'll likely see Hitmonkey face off against in the Hulu animated series, another one that shows up in the trailer appears to be none other than Fat Cobra. Fat Cobra is an Iron Fist villain with a long and complex history. He's been an opera singer, a murderer, a villain, a martial arts teacher, the sidekick of Ulysses Bloodstone, fought in multiple wars. You get the idea, he's done it all. His main objective in life was to defeat Xiang Yao, and when he finally accomplished this, he became one of the seven immortal weapons, which is one of the feats that he's known for today. Fat Cobra's true given name still remains unknown to us, and in fact, much of his own history was forgotten to him. It took a biographer of his to remind him of his own lengthy backstory and all that had happened before. Unlike Lady Bullseye, Fat Cobra is not just a super skilled killer and martial artist, he also possesses chi based powers that grant him super strength, durability, longevity, healing, senses, and even the power to sometimes teleport. Number 2, Imaginary? Initially when Hitmonkey showed up in New York City causing problems as a hitman, or really a Hit monkey. Spider Man did not even believe that he was real. Deadpool tried to explain the legend of Hit Monkey to Spider Man, but Spider Man believed that Deadpool was really the one behind all the hits going on. Truly, though, he wasn't. He was telling the truth. And Spider Man found this out the hard way when the duo crossed paths with Hit Monkey himself. You see, shortly after his first appearance, Hit Monkey also popped up in Deadpool series in issue 19. I think that was actually only like a month or so after even his first issue came out for his own comic. It turns out he was in the Big Apple to take out a hit on Deadpool. Deadpool. Hitmonkey proved too tough for both Deadpool and Spider Man, even teamed up against him. In the end, Hitmonkey succeeded. Well, both of them technically ended up getting blown apart and hurt pretty badly. Though, of course, this is Deadpool, so Wade just ended up healing and then getting tossed in Rikers. Poor Deadpool. <laughs> Number one, Ladies Monkey? So apparently, hot ladies like monkeys? We find out in Deadpool issue 19 that Hitmonkey is quite the ladies monkey. It's established in canon that there is just something super irresistible about him to the ladies. He arrives at a nightclub in said issue with a bunch of hot ladies who apparently were brought there by Hitmonkey himself, much to the dismay of someone else who is desperately trying to get in without any success. In the same issue, we also then witness a woman leave the side of a man she's chatting with who appears to be about to take her home to go join the Hitmonkey group of dates. People like monkeys, I guess. Or people like hired assassins? Or both? I don't know. Coming in at number 10, we have Matter Eater Lad. One of the best parts of the Peacemaker HBO Max show so far has been seeing all of the out there references and easter eggs that creator James Gunn has gotten away with making canon within the DCEU. And one of the most interesting references to another hero Peacemaker has met is Matter Eater Lad. A bizarre Silver Age of Comics character with the ability to literally eat anything, apparently Peacemaker has allied with this guy on a mission before, and has even seen him eat an entire restaurant. Given his knowledge of exactly how Matter Eater Lad's powers work, it's a fair assumption that Peacemaker would be an ideal candidate if Matter Eater Lad ever needed to be taken out. Just maybe don't let his mouth anywhere near your weaponry, Peacemaker. Coming in at number 9, we've got Frank Castle, aka The Punisher. Although they may come from different comic book universes, comparisons between The Punisher and Peacemaker are pretty easy to make, with both characters having a warped perspective on justice compared to many superheroes, and both characters also having a particular love for firearms. The thing that sets these two characters apart, however, is that Frank Castle still has a line he won't cross when it comes to cleaning up crime, and would never willingly hurt a child. Peacemaker, on the other hand, is supposedly so committed to his cause that he doesn't care how many men, women, or children he'd need to kill for peace. And this willingness to cross a taboo line that even the Punisher wouldn't cross might just bring Peacemaker out on top. Coming in at number 8, we have Vigilante. 
While Vigilante and Peacemaker might be an odd pair of friends with a weird but accepting relationship on the show, in the comics, they're usually portrayed as much more straightforward rivals. Possessing no superpowers, but a master in all sorts of weaponry and martial arts styles, Vigilante and Peacemaker are usually pretty evenly matched when they're positioned against one another by opposing forces. But given the extra abilities given to him by his variety of helmets, Peacemaker has just a few more tricks up his sleeve than his sometimes partner, sometimes rival. Coming in at number 7, we have Batmite. Another character made canon in the DCEU by an offhanded reference, Batmite is a troublesome imp from the same fifth dimension as the Superman villain Mr. Mixiez Pitalik. Except this guy is a huge Batman fanboy and loves to be a giant nuisance to the Dark Knight. Given Peacemaker's annoyance of being compared to such a tiny and infuriating character, it seems likely that he'd try to find a helmet specifically to take on a fifth dimensional villain. Which sounds ludicrous, but we've already seen that Peacemaker's father has space warping technology in his secret supervillain bunker. Whatever the case, Peacemaker's brand of violence would definitely be a shocking change of pace for the character of Batmite, so maybe the imp should watch his back after getting mentioned on the show. Coming in at number 6, we have Aquaman. As a superhero, Aquaman was a bit of a joke character for a long time before more recent incarnations have begun to successfully inject just the right amount of seriousness to the character. However, that doesn't stop Peacemaker from saying some not-safe-for-work things about Aquaman on the show, and given both John Cena and Jason Momoa's amount of muscle, that would be one hell of a showdown to see. When asked in a promotional interview if Peacemaker could beat Aquaman in a fight, John Cena replied that Aquaman's fitness was one of the only superheroes that gave him pause. However, given how the Peacemaker team was able to handle a gorilla in last week's episode, maybe animal superpowers aren't the best defense against a hero as violent as Peacemaker. Coming in at number 5, we have Rick Flagg. Spoiler alert if you haven't seen James Gunn's The Suicide Squad yet, but one of the better twists of the movie and the reason Peacemaker's solo series was such a surprise is because Peacemaker was such a fantastic villain in the film. Ordered by Amanda Waller to prevent information on Starro from getting out to the public, Peacemaker is forced by his twisted moral code to fight and eventually brutally kill a hero he admired, Rick Flagg, who is disgusted that he got beaten by a man such as Peacemaker. It's a pretty devastating death scene in an otherwise pretty comedic movie, and unlike other hypotheticals on this list, we got to see all too well that Peacemaker can definitely beat Rick Flagg. Coming in at number 4, we've got what's sure to be a controversial pick with Spider-Man. No, these two characters have never crossed over and interacted before, but if the corporate overlords ever allowed it, I'm not sure I would bet on Spidey. Peter Parker would obviously not agree with Peacemaker's brand of justice, given how often he gets into conflicts with other violent vigilantes like Punisher and Daredevil, and would likely try to defeat Peacemaker if they ever met. However, unlike most heroes, Peacemaker wouldn't be startled by the fact that Spider-Man is just a teenager. As we mentioned before, Peacemaker is willing to fight and kill anyone in the name of peace. And this means the usual moments that older members of the Avengers would have of expressing worry at Spider-Man's youth would mean absolutely nothing to Peacemaker. So, uh, hope your spider sense still works, Peter. Otherwise, Peacemaker is coming for you. Coming in at number three, we have Batman. Unfortunately, due to YouTube's monetization policies, I can't repeat any of the colorful language that Peacemaker uses to describe Batman on the show. But it's safe to say that Peacemaker isn't a fan, whether out of genuine dislike or because of jealousy at the fact that Batman is apparently a much more beloved figure in the DCEU now. Whatever the case, Batman actually would have a hard time dealing with an individual like Peacemaker because of the vast difference in their vigilante styles. Batman refuses to kill, whereas Peacemaker is all about killing in the most over-the-top and gratuitous ways possible. Whereas Batman would be trying to capture Peacemaker alive, Peacemaker would be willing to blow up an entire building just to fry the bat. And while you can argue about the morals of being a superhero, Peacemaker's brutality just might take the win here. 
Coming in at number two, we have Steve Rogers, AKA Captain America. In a way, the modern incarnation of Peacemaker can be seen as a commentary on patriotic superheroes like Captain America, showing just how terrifying someone willing to do literally anything for their country or ideology would be if they also dressed up in a colorful helmet and costume. Whereas Captain America has been shown to become introspective on what justice actually means and whether following his country is always the right option, Peacemaker is Cap's patriotism taken to the extreme, and who knows just how far he'd take that in a fight if the two of them ever had to meet. And finally, coming in at our top spot, we have the one and only Superman. I once again can't repeat what Peacemaker said about Superman on the show, but needless to say, these two would likely not get along. And while it seems easy to say that someone like Peacemaker could never hope to even injure Superman, the DCEU might actually beg to differ. The Suicide Squad movie makes a big point of noting how similar in skills and backstories both Peacemaker and Bloodsport are. And while Bloodsport ultimately wins their final shootout, both of them appear to essentially have perfect aim. And with Bloodsport being confirmed to have been locked up in the first place for putting Superman in the ICU with a special bullet, who knows just how badly Peacemaker would mess up Kal-El if he ever got his hands on some kryptonite ammunition. Mm -hmm.